there's a ton of noise out there. So how do you get decision makers to pay attention to your brand? Start a podcast and invite your ideal clients to be guests on your show. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to the B2B Growth Show, a podcast dedicated to helping B2B executives achieve explosive growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. I'm James Carberry. And I'm Jonathan Green. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. Today we are joined by Brandon Bruce. Brandon is the COO and co-founder at Cirrus Insight. Uh, He's also the author of The Slow Sale, How Slowing Down Wins More Deals. He's also a veteran of the B2B Growth Show. Uh, And in addition to all of those things, Brandon is also a candidate for the Knoxville, Tennessee City Council, which I think is so cool. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's quite the resume. Excited to have you back on the show. But uh, and, uh, today we're, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different um, than the last episode. Obviously, we like to uh, keep the content fresh. We're going to be talking about you know how to slow down. We're going to be talking about your book. We're going to be talking about some things that um, you've got going on at Serious Insight. But before we get into that, for, for new listeners or people that need a refresher course, tell us a little about what you and your team at Serious Insight are up to these days. Yeah, Serious Insight, we build uh, sales software for sales teams. Our claim to fame, if you will, is connecting Salesforce with Gmail and Outlook and email on your iPhone or your Android device. So we were the first application six years ago when we launched Serious Insight to connect Gmail with Salesforce. So we sync emails and sync calendar events and enable people to really do everything they want to do in the CRM without ever leaving their inbox. And so the reviews that we get from customers are usually twofold. Users say, uh, thank you. You're saving me a lot of time. I get to use Salesforce without ever logging into Salesforce again because I never like doing that. <laughs> and then managers, meanwhile, say, uh, this is great. We had invested a ton of money and time in Salesforce, and we just could not for the life of us get our team to use it. And now that it's in the inbox where they work with customers all day in, in the email inbox and in the calendar, now we're finally using it. Data's flowing in, we can run good reports, and we're starting to understand how we do sales. So that's where we came from. The last time I was on the show, we talked about the quote-unquote you know, $14 billion CRM debacle, meaning half of the seats that we all buy for CRMs, Salesforce, Dynamics, SAP, et cetera, are unused, right? They're essentially shelfware. We're not mm-hmm. using them. And that's one thing that Serious Insight is trying to solve, which is meeting users where they are in the inbox, in their calendar, so that we can update the CRM really in the background and enable users access to it without forcing them into a, into a third platform, into the CRM platform uh, that they're loath to use. So now we're sort of looking at it even more so from a marketing standpoint, and, and starting to borrow some ideas that have been around in marketing for a long time, like the concept of nurturing, and kind of bring that into the sales context. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's a it's a powerful tool, and of course, we've got a lot of marketers in our audience. So I think they're you know some of this is going to be sales, but I think I think marketers are also going to be able to take a, a lot out of this content from today's episode. And we're going to kind of kick things off. We're gonna we're gonna talk about. Uh, your new book, uh, The Slow Sale, How Slowing Down Wins More Deals. And we're going to be kind of, you know, talking about some of the some of the main takeaways from this book. So, uh, Brandon, why don't you take it away from there? Yeah, I think one of the one of the impetus is impeti. Uh, <laughs> for, I don't know. I mean, I think, but, uh, for the book was an experience I had about a year into starting a company. I took my first long weekend away from the company. Right. So I was out in a place where I didn't have connectivity and that freaked me out. So I was the classic anxious founder thinking I've got three big deals for us at the time uh, that I thought were getting close to being closed. And my history was very zero inbox. I need to follow up with those deals and I need to get them closed through you know sheer force of personality and good follow-ups, et cetera. And so it made me nervous to kind of check out for a long weekend and leave those deals uh, in the balance. What I learned now is that by letting them simmer, And then when I came back from that long weekend, all three deals came back to me. And we actually closed all three. And that was a big uh, shot in the arm for the company at the time. And so what we did last year is we looked at all of our sales data. And we had some uh, analytics folks really crunch the numbers on it. And what we saw was 
when people started a trial of Serious Insight, there was a flurry of activity, lots of emails from both marketing automation, but also direct, lots of questions and answers. Then, there were, then it kind of settled in for two weeks into this regular pattern of contacts. And then there was a flurry toward the end of the trial where we were answering final use case questions, but also exchanging contracts and red lines and so forth. And then it went into this 10 day just lag where there was no communication. So the deal's not closed and it looks a lot like the deal's dead. And that freaked me out as a salesperson. It freaked me out as a sales manager because I was hounding the team and saying like, hey, I follow up on that deal. Is it, are they coming back? Are they going to sign? Are we going to get it in this month, this quarter? Let's move these deals. What we ended up calling that period is the quiet period. So for about 10 days, customers go into a quiet period. There's no conversation. They're rallying their internal groups. They're looking at the contract. They're talking about budget. They're confirming all the use cases and they're getting it to the person or team that can sign off on the deal. So if it went beyond the 10 days, then it was go time on our side, right? Flurry of activity to get back in touch, make sure the deal is not in fact dead. But typically after that 10 days, then they, the customer would come back, maybe have a couple final questions, but maybe you just sign on the line uh, and get to a closed one deal. So part of the slow sale is for me, uh, embracing this concept of the quiet period and going against today's trend, which is uh, all things faster. And we see this in sales, we call it sales acceleration, but we also see it in marketing, right? We want to get the message to the person, we get it to her early and often. And sometimes, for those of us that are also on the buying side, it's just too much. It's too much of a barrage, and it turns us off to the point that we're not reading those marketing communications anymore, we're not responding to the sales team anymore, we're, we're checking out. Even when we're particularly interested in a product, it's just too big of a process, and we want to get away from it. So by slowing down, taking our time, making sure the touch points on both the sales and the marketing side are thoughtful, short, intentional, timely. We win more deals that way. We embrace this concept of quiet period and we're not always trying to accelerate all the time. Yeah. Hearing you describe it, you know, you're, you're starting to get back into that realm of the smarmy, stereotypical, pushy salesman, you know, and that's just, it's, that's not what drives sales anymore. You know, people have, uh, access to information and options and they don't want to feel like they're getting pushed or bullied into something. So it makes a lot of sense what you're talking about. Yeah. And we're kind of trying to borrow a concept and a term that's been around in the marketing world for a long time, which is this concept of nurturing. The, the person came in, they expressed some interest. Maybe they downloaded an ebook or visited the website, maybe even called into the main line, but they're not necessarily ready today to pull the trigger, how can we nurture that relationship, provide them with the right information at the right time over a stretch of time so that when they are ready to buy the car, try the software, et cetera, then we're there for them and we haven't forgotten the follow up uh, that we've been in front of them. And so thinking about that now in terms of the who owns those communications, because historically, and we're a consumer of marketing automation, we use Pardot, we have a lot of customers that use, you know, Eloqua, Exact Target. Pardot, HubSpot, Marketo, et cetera, to make all those contacts. Now what's coming up is marketing has historically owned all those communications. Now sales are starting to jump in and saying, uh, hey, we've always had CRM in sales, but CRM is kind of a misnomer. Uh, no one's ever managed a relationship inside of a database, right? <laughs> so Salesforce Dynamics, these are not customer relationship management platforms. What they are are management and, and reporting uh, data platforms. Uh, and they're great at that and extremely valuable. And we've built an entire company on Salesforce, uh, so we love it. But sales teams are now looking for tools. What can we use uh, in sales to get in touch with customers, cultivate, nurture those relationships over time? And so now a lot of companies are trying to figure out, okay, well, historically, marketing has owned all of that. Uh, what about sales? Is sales going to invest in these, quote unquote, sales acceleration tools? And Sears Insight is one of those. So in a lot of ways, we're talking with companies now about how are you using marketing automation? How do you take customers on a complete customer journey? And is the tool you're using today the right fit? So, so far, what we found is a lot of companies are overpaying and underusing traditional marketing automation. So they're paying for a big platform that can do a lot, and they're using it to send out a monthly newsletter, uh, which could easily be sent out with a much simpler, lower cost platform. Meanwhile, to do the types of contacts that they they could or should be doing with marketing automation, it's better owned by the sales team, uh, the team that has those one-to-one -one relationships so that the messaging can be coming out from that salesperson's email inbox. So it's going to have higher deliverability, 
higher open rates, higher click throughs, higher response rates, because it's coming from that salesperson directly from their inbox to the customer rather than from a third party platform from a server where it, you know, it's harder than ever to get an email through to a prospect's inbox uh, because of all the algorithms out there that are designed to intercept uh, the emails that all of us are trying to send to get in touch with prospects. So it's a really interesting time, I think, as the marketing department and the sales department are now having more and more conversations to, to quote unquote, define the relationship, right? The uncomfortable DTR conversation, I think, is <laughs> happening increasingly across all these companies where a year or two ago, we talked to sales teams and it was like, oh, the templates we send out to our customers, yeah, marketing owns all that. And they own the whole platform. And in fact, we don't even know when the messages are going to come out. Like they, they handle that because that's what marketing does. Now sales is saying, well, yeah, marketing sends out those communications, but we also have our own platform that we're using to do, you know, mixed media messaging. So we send out, and, and this is a lot of people are using Serious Insight for this now. On day one, we want to send an email, but on day two, we want to make a phone call and use a script and then log that, log the call result to Salesforce. And then on day five, we want to connect on LinkedIn with this particular message and then rinse and repeat this cadence over the next three months as we try to break through to this prospect and show them the value we have. Um, and so that's a really interesting dynamic to see sales and marketing come together and figure out how to work better together. Yeah, yeah. Well, and certainly, you know, uh, ABM and aligning sales and marketing, these are not new or novel concepts anymore. But the way in which I think the um, businesses are are pursuing those ideas, you know, there is some flexibility. There's, the, you know, there's going to be different approaches. So it'll be interesting to see how that sort of shakes out and, and kind of what ends up leading the pack. But you have mentioned, of course, there's various tools and platforms and pieces of software out there um, that you can use for marketing, for the salesperson, whoever we're talking about, wherever it ends up. And one of the things that you had mentioned offline was artificial intelligence. And, and you kind of had some thoughts about AI and, and that role it's going to play. Yeah, I mean, and, and from my side, I kind of like to push back. So my line is, I think today, artificial intelligence is long on artificial and short on intelligence. <laughs> uh, and what I mean by that is, let's use quote unquote AI and, and unfortunately, it's too much of a buzzword. So most often, if you read a press release or description of an application, you can reasonably substitute the word software or computing for AI, and it still makes sense. Because most AI is not particularly intelligent. It's just, it's just good software. You know, you're talking about basic pattern recognition and data mining across a very large data set, where it's very difficult for us as a human to look across 100,000 rows in a spreadsheet that's exactly what computers have been good at for a really long time. So let's keep using them for that. Yeah, but uh, da but, me, but data mining doesn't sound as, as sexy as AI. It right? doesn't, and I get it, right? <laughs> and we could easily do a press release, and maybe we will, saying like, hey, we've infused AI throughout Serious <laughs> Insight because we're doing a lot of things that we think are cool, uh, and they make sense, and it's just smart software. But to call it artificial intelligence gets a little overblown, and I think <laughs> you know the risk is by overusing the buzzword that then there will eventually be kind of a backlash because people will have uh, bad experiences. For example, turning over the management of your calendar to a robot that's now supposed to schedule your meetings for you, in my experience, is a bad idea. Uh, it's not a good experience for the customer to realize that they're having a conversation with a person that's not actually a human being. Um, <laughs> right? So it's like you think you're scheduling a meeting with Brandon, but now I've passed you off to my assistant Joe, and my assistant Joe doesn't exist. So as soon as you start asking Joe questions about, oh, well, and, and what's the dress code, or uh, which Starbucks should we meet at? I mean, who knows, right? Joe's not a human being. And so that's hard because from the customer perspective, they're thinking, well, you know, I got chucked off to a robot. Maybe the person doesn't really want to meet with me. And now I'm kind of annoyed because it's a bad customer service experience. So I think on both the marketing and sales side, let's use AI slash software to do what it's really good at. Look at vast data sets, uh, try to identify patterns that we can use in our day to day jobs. Let's not use it to replace those essential human components where psychology is so important, predicting the next step in what's going to happen in a deal. And so far in my experience, and we've tried and used a, a lot of software and tried to build some of it too, uh, it's very difficult and it doesn't work uh, particularly well. So I think computers are good at, and I like to make the analogy to Dragnet, just the facts, Sam, <laughs> right? So computers are good at telling us this is what happened and this is when it happened. They're not good at yet making suggestions to the marketer, to the salesperson. 
So an example of that would be, Brandon, it's been seven days since you last heard from this customer. You should send them an email today. And I can say, no, I shouldn't, because they told me on the phone they're going to be on vacation for 14 days. So why would I send another email today? It's just going to annoy them, right? This is bad for the customer relationship. The computer doesn't know that. The computer is much better to tell us, hey, by the way, Brandon, it's been seven days since you heard from that customer. That's a fact. And then I can dismiss it and say, oh, yeah, you're right. It has been seven days. And normally, I would want to follow up. But I know this customer as a human being, and I'm not going to because that would be bad for this deal. When we provide the wrong suggestions or when the computer does something on behalf of the marketer or the salesperson because the computer thinks it's the right thing to do, that's when you get uh, rebellion against the software. Uh, You get people saying like, oh, it's saying I should do this and I know I shouldn't, so I'm going to rip it out. When it just tells us the facts, then we can say, that's great. And now I can make the insight on top of the data. But when the computer is trying to provide the insight, it's too early for that right now in my experience. Most of the software that's trying to provide that level of insight isn't working. Yeah. Well, I, uh, Brandon, I think you've you've dated yourself a little bit with the Dragnet reference. Uh, hopefully that people – Hopefully most most people in our audience uh, still remember that or know what we're talking about. But, you know, speaking of this timely follow-up, I mean, you you know, this example of a computer, AI, you know, whatever software would tell you it's been seven days, you should email this person. Uh, You know, one of the last points that you wanted to make was that, uh, you know, don't let these opportunities slip through the cracks for lack of thoughtful, timely follow-up. Yeah, it's like all of our uh, worst nightmares as salespeople is – is letting a deal fall through the cracks because we got busy on another deal and it just didn't get the attention it needed or we didn't provide the information on time or we missed a response from the customer. And so, you know, our, the big release that we did just about a week ago, we called the Flight Plans edition of Cirrus Insight. And we've drawn this very big tortured analogy around following up with, with, with customers like being in flight. When you're grounded, the deal's not going anywhere. Where you're in flight, things are happening and you're progressing along that customer journey. So it enables our customers to basically program a winning sales playbook. So this is how we do sales development. First, we reach out by email. Second, we use this call script on day three. Uh, That's usually successful. Next, we reach out on LinkedIn. Then we send out three emails over the course of two and a half weeks, et cetera. And our sales cycle, of course, is different than yours and different from each of your listeners. So everybody can program in their own playbook, just like you do in marketing automation platforms to say this is the sequence or the cadence that we want to reach out to a given customer. But you can do it in very, in our experience, what works best is very short, uh, timely follow-ups. That way, the customer is getting what they need, but they're not getting overwhelmed and hounded. Because we find as buyers, you know, if someone's hitting us again and again, like, hey, are we going to get the contract signed? Or hey, I just really wanted to get in touch with you to share something. It's about them, right? It's not about us as a customer. And we start to feel rebellious and we don't want to do the deal anymore. When it's about us and it's, hey, we want to provide this additional valuable tidbit. And hey, it's been two weeks. And so it's a reasonable time to follow up and figure out if we're going to have a customer relationship or not. That's great. And so it's, it's the ability to program in the playbook. And then the, the big... Uh, value add that we hope that we're making is this concept of outcomes. So not only do we want to have activity-based metrics, are we sending out the right number of contacts to the right number of prospects that we're trying to work today, but is what we're doing working? And, And I always try to caution people against these phrases like artificial intelligence, but another catchphrase has become sales acceleration, as if that in itself is a great thing. The danger of acceleration is that you, you may be just heading faster in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> right? Acceleration is a change in velocity. And velocity has a direction. It's not just speed. It's not just, hey, we're going to close deals faster. You may be making a lot of calls. What if calls don't work for you? And all of us have found that in sales and marketing. We try something really hard. And then one day we realize, hopefully it's not too long in the future, that it didn't work. And we've got to pivot and try something else. And, and, of course, the thing that worked last year isn't going to work again this year. So what we want to do is help teams define outcomes so that they can say, look how well this worked or look how poorly this worked, and we can continue to get better at it. So for example, a sales development team could say, when we take people through this cadence at the, you know, 60% of the time we reach this outcome and the putative dollar value of that outcome, let's say a trial start is a hundred dollars. And so great, our team collectively got 200 of those times $25. Look at the impact we've made. That's not real money yet because we still have to close the deals. But using analytics, we can say a certain percentage of those trials will convert and it will be worth that much uh, to the company on top line revenue. Uh, And you can do that at the SDR level, at the account executive level and at the customer success level. And so it's it's defining those outcomes and then tying it together really closely 
with, in our case, uh, Salesforce, right? So we were the first app to connect Gmail with Salesforce. Today, we connect Outlook and, and all the other email platforms with it. And so for us, it's really important that all of that data flows into Salesforce, but that you can also build processes in Salesforce that trigger these flights to take off so that, oh, this happened with the customer. We're now going to send them this email or make this phone call or re- reach out on LinkedIn or take this other action item that will help to advance the deal. Yeah. So, well, so we're excited about it. Very well. It sounds very exciting. I mean, we're we're of course excited for you. We're excited excited for a serious insight. And uh, if any of our listeners, anyone in our audience, is interested in you know following up, finding out a little bit more about uh, flight plan, following up uh, and learning a little bit more about how to slow down, uh, you know how slowing down wins more deals, or you know even this kind of idea, you know where uh, you know the sales and marketing and who kind of owns those touch points and and kind of where is that going. What's the best way for them to go about uh, reaching out to you or to your company? Yeah, for reaching out to me, LinkedIn is a great way. So if you put Brandon Bruce in LinkedIn, uh, I'll show up there. Like you mentioned at the top of the show, I'll show up as as co-founder of Sears Insight, but I'm also uh, running for city council here in Knoxville because who better to get involved in local politics than an entrepreneur, right, that that wants to advance the community. So I'm having fun with the campaign this summer. So LinkedIn is a great way to reach me. The the best way to reach out uh, to the company, to Sears Insight, is through our website, so seriousinsight.com, we've got folks on live chat all day. Uh, we've got about 15 certified Salesforce administrators. So for people that really want to tighten up their workflow between marketing automation and sales acceleration and their core Salesforce CRM platform, we've got a great team of folks that are really knowledgeable, both on the technical side to make sure all the sales operations and marketing auto- operations part works, uh, but also on the actual playbook, right? Putting the right templates in, the right call scripts to make sure the whole thing runs like a well-oiled machine. Uh, so we've got free trials there and, and a great team that can answer questions. Fantastic. Brandon, thanks again so much for your time on the show today. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. Uh, good luck with the with the book and, of course, good luck with the candidacy. Yeah, thank you. It'll be a fun summer. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> really appreciate it. To ensure that you never miss an episode of the B2B Growth Show, subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. This guarantees that every episode will get delivered directly to your device. If you'd like to connect with B2B executives from all over the world, make sure to join our private Facebook community. There are some incredible conversations happening inside this group. To join, visit b2bgrowthshow.com slash FB. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.